NAB 2024 has just finished over in Vegas, and there have been loads of really exciting announcements on the lead up and during the show. And in this video, we're going to try and cover everything we saw at the show. This is going to be a long video, so grab a drink, get comfy, and let's get into it. First off, Blackmagic have announced an incredible range of new products. Here's a list of everything, but we want to quickly talk about some of the most interesting ones for us. They actually announced a bunch of new cameras, but one series in particular I know a lot of people have been waiting for, and that is the Pixis. This is the long-awaited box camera that Blackmagic users have been wanting them to create for a while now. It takes the Cinema Camera 6K sensor and screen and reformats it into a more modular box with some awesome additions, including a whole new array of buttons. The sensor in the Cinema Camera 6K produces a great image, though its readout is slow compared to other more modern sensors now. The Pixis can record the same resolutions and frame rates as the Cinema Camera 6K, which is decent, but I know some users wanted just a little bit more out of this system. You can shoot a range of B-Raw flavors and H.264 proxies, but no ProRes unfortunately. The camera has clearly been designed to be operated via the side LCD, which I find is an interesting choice as a lot of solo operators may struggle with this design. I think if this panel could flip out, it could make it a far more mass appealing camera than it is. It's definitely been designed to be modular, which means it should be good to rig up in different configurations. But because of this layout with the screen on the side, I am intrigued to see how it feels when operating it handheld. On the right, you have a modular side plate so you can change out the layout of it depending on how you want to configure the camera. On the rear of the camera, you have a good array of inputs and outputs. You have a dual CFexpress Type B card slot, 3.5mm mic input and headphone output, a 1G Ethernet port, 12 volt DC in, a 12G SDI output, reference or timecode BNC, and a USB-C which you can use for external recording or mobile data. On the front, you have a mini XLR input which can provide phantom power. This is all powered via a BPU style battery, which I think is a good choice, as there are plenty on the market already, you can get a good range of sizes, and they are decently affordable now. The camera is available with three different lens mounts, L, EF, and PL. As the Pixis does not have an ND system built in, which is a bit of a shame, my recommendation would be to grab the L mount version as you can then adapt it to EF or PL and use an adapter that has the ability to use drop-in filters. Though if you want the most rock solid mount, the PL or EF models will provide that. It looks like you can remove the mount, but there's no mention online about whether this is a user replaceable mount or not, so it most likely isn't, which is a shame. It's priced at just over £2,900 for the EF and L mount variants, and just under £3,100 for the PL one. So you are paying a slight premium over the Cinema Camera 6K to have the different body design. And considering what you get, I think it's pretty well priced. You'll just need to add a monitor or the new Ursa Cine viewfinder, which Blackmagic also announced with these new cameras. This viewfinder is designed to be used with the new Ursa Cine cameras, which we'll get onto, as well as the Pixis. I honestly wish more brands would offer optional EVFs like this for their systems. It uses a single USB-C cable for both power and data, which is really good. The updated mounting brackets and rod system also look much better than their previous Ursa viewfinder. It uses a 1920x1080 OLED panel, comes with two different eye cups, looks to have a good dark to range, and has a range of buttons for camera control on the top of it. It looks like it will integrate really nicely with these new cameras. It looks really good, especially considering that it costs under £2,000, which includes the mounting brackets as well. I'm sure this will be a popular solution for many people grabbing these cameras. They have also announced two new cameras in their new Ursa Cine line, a 12K full frame variant and a 17K 65mm variant, which both sound pretty insane. When designing the Ursa Cine line, Blackmagic wanted to build a platform with no limitations when it came to scope or cost. And this is evident with the massive feature set that these cameras have, but also the 12K's higher price than you may expect from a Blackmagic camera. However, when you compare what this camera offers versus other cameras in the market, it's still well priced. In 12K 3x2, you can go up to 80 frames per second, and then as you lower your resolution, you can increase your frame rate. So in 8K or 4K 2.4 to 1 aspect ratio, you can go up to 224 frames per second. The camera body itself is almost like they took an Ursa Mini and then shoved as many upgrades into it as they could, but the platform itself has been completely redesigned. Both of these new sensors have been designed by Blackmagic and use the same symmetrical RGB Debayer as the original 12K, which has pros and cons 
such as the internal sensor scaling options. This new 12K sensor has an increased photosite size from the original 12K, which should increase dynamic range and low light over that camera. Sensor readout speeds are already online for this camera, and in 12K 3x2 open gate mode, its readout is only 12 milliseconds, which is actually not too bad considering its size and resolution. It's really good that Blackmagic published these numbers at release. I wish other brands did this as well. The camera has a bunch of different recording formats, so depending on what lens you're using or what your production needs, you can easily just switch between them. The 9K mode is the camera's Super 35 mode, but there is currently no 16mm crop mode yet, but something that Blackmagic are willing to explore in the future. It comes with a PL mount as standard, but has a user changeable mount that can be switched between EF, LPL and Hasselblad. The lens mounts themselves house the shims, not the camera, which should make swaps on set faster. The 12K also has a built-in ND filter system like the previous Ursa Mini cameras. They have also introduced a new set of recording media that uses NVMe drives to handle the crazy amount of data this camera captures. They will be offering a Super Express adapter for this system as well, but this will have recording limitations. 8TB of this storage is included with the camera, and they have also released a large reader for these mags as well. They will also be making a 16TB module. You can also pull and manage the data via the 10G Ethernet port on the rear of the camera, which could make for faster data transfers while on set. It can only shoot in B-RAW, you have no option for ProRes, but you can shoot H.264 proxies. On the assistant side, you have a massive bright monitor where you can fully control the camera and even get full lens metadata readout via the iData pins on the mount, which is a pretty awesome feature. If the camera doesn't recognize the lens, it will read its endpoints and then create a map of the lens linked to the serial number being fed out into the iData, which again is a really awesome feature. On the operator side, you have a nice array of buttons and a display for control, as well as the regular flip out monitor for full control of the camera. On the back, it has two 12G SDI outputs, a BNC for reference and timecode in and out. On the front, you have a three pin Fisher and seven pin Limo, both of which are 24 volt and share two amps between them. The antennas on the top are used for the camera's built-in Wi-Fi, so you can offload H.264 proxies while using the camera wirelessly. Because of all this new tech, it's a 24 volt camera system, so Blackmagic decided to make it a B-mount camera as standard. However, they are going to explore using V and gold mounts in the future, as the plate is interchangeable. Its power draw is roughly between 80 and 150 watts, depending on what mode you're in and what accessories you have plugged into it. There are also several USB-C ports across the camera for future accessories, the EVF that we mentioned earlier, tethering to a phone, or even recording externally. The 12K looks like a really interesting camera, but I'm super excited to check out the 17K 65mm version. This camera will use the same body as the 12K full frame, but with this larger sensor. This 17K sensor is 50.808mm wide and 23.316mm tall giving it a 55.9mm diagonal, and it consists of 17,520 by 8,040 pixels. It's massive, and will hopefully result in some really impressive imagery. It's not going to hit the market until later this year, but it's really exciting, and I cannot wait to get my hands on one to test and shoot with. Let us know if you have any questions about any of these awesome Blackmagic cameras in the comments below. Blackmagic also announced Resolve 19 and a couple of new physical controls for Resolve. These new panels are the Micro Color Panel and Replay Editor. The Micro Color Panel is the super compact USB-C or Bluetooth panel designed to be used with smaller workstations or even an iPad which you can use with the slot built into it. It has nice backlit keys, your standard three ball and ring layout for control and an array of dials for different controls. It's also very affordable at just £415, which when paired with how compact it is, could make it a popular option for the lower end of the market or people wanting to use a more traditional color panel interface while on the go. They also announced the Replay Editor. This is aimed at being used in Resolve's cut page for replay and multicam editing. On top of all of this, Blackmagic also announced a bunch of awesome broadcast products. If you want to learn more about these, I suggest checking out the very long but detailed Blackmagic announcement stream. Link to that is in the description. Freefly have been busy with creating their newest slow motion camera, the Ember S2.5K. This new camera is essentially the S5K Ember, which they released a while ago now, but with a 2.5K sensor housed inside, 
aimed at capturing higher frame rates than the S5K at the compromise of resolution. This means that the S2.5K is aimed at people who don't mind this trade-off, so basically users who are using it for more R&D or scientific purposes. It can capture up to 3,563 frames per second with that dropping as you increase the resolution. With the S2.5K, some other new things have been released as well. The biggest in my mind being the introduction of a pre-record feature and a new 2.56 terabyte PSLC high endurance SSD, which comes standard with the S2.5K. And it's going to be perfect for the new pre-roll function that the S2.5K has and the original S5K will be getting in a new firmware coming out on May 1st. This is a massive feature that will work with the S5K's original SSD as well, but you will burn through the life of that SSD very quickly compared to this new one. This new SSD has 10 times the endurance of the original SSD in the Ember 5K and is rated to handle up to 10,000 hours of continuous recording or 80 petabytes of data written to it. This new SSD is available as an optional extra for the S5K, so if you want to really take advantage of this pre-record workflow, this is an awesome update and will open up these cameras to a whole new range of end users. When you think about how expensive other high frame rate cameras are that feature internal cache, this upgrade isn't actually that expensive considering the functionality that you are getting. For S5K users wanting this upgrade, you can send it back to Freefly to do this for you or you'll be able to do this yourself with a guide that Freefly will be releasing with the SSD. It seems from what Freefly have said in their update video that you can pre-record for as long as you want, then hit the record button, keep rolling, stop, and then immediately start rolling again. This is pretty unique if true for a high frame rate camera that uses a cache system. Unfortunately, Sony has requested that Freefly stop selling the E-mount that came with the S5K. So the S2.5K comes with a locking active EF mount as standard now. I think this could be a good change as there is plenty of awesome EF glass out there on the market. And if you want to chuck anything else on it, Kipatai and C7 adapters offer a range of lens adapters for this system. The active EF mount will be available as an extra for existing Ember S5K owners, but you may need a board replacement if you do want to grab it. So get in contact with us or Freefly if you want to learn more about how this works. As we mentioned earlier, there'll be a firmware update in May for the S5K and an update to their app, which will bring a bunch of things, including stabilization and a new mono mode where you can get more frames out of the S5K at the sacrifice of color. Overall, there's some really cool things here from Freefly, and I'm really excited to get the new SSD into our Ember S5K as it really will make shooting with that camera much better. Anyway, if you want to learn more about Freefly's NAB announcements, check out their overview video on their YouTube. Harry have announced a few new things in the build up to NAB. This included their new Alexa 35 live multicam system. This builds off of the Alexa 35 but tailors it for live production workflows. This means that you can get the same incredible image quality as the Alexa 35, but with this large LPS1 unit bolted onto the back to give you all the regular inputs and outputs and control that you'd expect to see on high-end broadcast cameras. Ari showed off the whole solution in their great video overview, so if you want to learn more about this system, check that out. With how Ari adapted the Amira before like this, it isn't too surprising to see this come out, and I'm really interested to see what productions end up using them. At the show, Ari were also showing off their two new LED Fresnel lights, the L5C Plus and the L7C Plus. These are up to 90% brighter than the original L series lights. The L5C is a 100 watt RGBW lamp, and the L7C is a 180 watt RGBW lamp. They both have a 2800 to 10,000 Kelvin range and now have a LAN port for network control and onboard control inspired by Ari's sky panel fixtures. They look like nice modern updates to Ari's excellent Fresnel lights. Just before NAB, Ari announced SUP3 for the L-Cube and SUP2.1 for the C-Force Mini RF. This update for the L-Cube brings support for Ari's high-speed protocol and support for focus bug licenses when used in conjunction with the C-Force Mini RF. The high-speed protocol is much faster than the previous standard, which means that your focus readout or focus bug focusing will be much more accurate. The new C-Force Mini RF update brings focus bug and cine fade license support, improves red camera control with a focus on ND control via the Hi5 via a C-Force Mini RF motor, Cam to LBUS can now be used for camera control and lens data rather than connecting to the EXT port as well. Encoder mode has also been added so you can control the lens manually with the motor attached. And a bunch of small bug fixes have also been added. 
Both of these new updates are available now to download on Ari's website. DJI announced a bunch of new products just before NAB. First off was the introduction of the Focus Pro LiDAR system. And we created a pretty in-depth video about this earlier this month. So if you want to learn more, check out our video for that. But long story short, the Focus Pro is DJI's newest LiDAR based focusing system, which can be used with and without a gimbal. If you want to learn more about it, I suggest checking out the video covering it. At the same time as announcing the Focus Pro, they also released the RS4 and RS4 Pro. These new gimbals have a new stabilization algorithm, an updated horizontal shooting plate, and they're made from a new Teflon coated aluminium, which should result in smoother balancing. The differences aren't massive between these new gimbals and the RS3, but if you're an older Ronin user, you should definitely check out these new ones. They also announced the Avasa 2, their latest FPV drone, along with new other bits within this ecosystem. This new drone is lighter, has a longer flight time, and features a larger sensor than the previous Avasa. It can capture 4K in a 4x3 aspect ratio up to 60p, and up to 120p in 2.7K 16x9 but there is no 24 or 25 frames per second currently, just 30p. It can record in 10-bit H.265 D-Log-M and has 46 gigabytes of internal memory as well as the ability to use a micro SD card. They also brought out the Goggles 3, which brings a new real view mode which uses cameras on the front of the headset to give you a view of your surroundings while keeping the headset on. You can also now stream the camera's feed from the drone to a mobile device, which is pretty cool. All this DJI kit is available to pre-order now on our website. Just before NAB, it was announced that Nikon's acquisition of RED has now been completed. This meant at NAB they had a joint booth with Nikon, RED and Mark Roberts Motion Control all sharing one space. I think this is a really nice statement from Nikon to show the direction they want to expand their business in. At the show, RED also announced their new Cine Broadcast module, which is compatible with all V-Raptor cameras, including the new X and XL cameras. This new module has been designed to slide these cameras into live broadcast workflows. You can get up to two channels of 4K60 over 12G SDI, or a up to 4K60 JPEG XS feed over IP, as it features SMPTE ST2110, and it has a Leo SMPTE hybrid fiber optical cable, which can be connected to a rack mountable 2RU base station. With cinematic live broadcast acquisition becoming more and more popular, I think this is a logical next step for RED. Music festivals being streamed and captured could look amazing using a mix of RED's cameras, for example. Panasonic has released firmware for the S52 and S52X. These new cameras were already incredibly well featured, especially considering their price. And this new update brings some pretty good new features to them. You have the introduction of internal frame IO connectivity and new internal proxy recording. You can shoot H.264 or ProRes proxies with the X but the regular S52 is limited to just H.264 proxies. The firmware also improves the autofocus in these cameras with a focus on improving the recognition of subjects. It brings animal eye tracking as well as car and motorcycle recognition. A new high mode has been added to the e-stabilization function. This electronically corrects your footage, which means it does crop, but could be good for more action heavy scenes. It's been specifically designed for video, so should be good when you need that extra step of stabilization. And lastly, a pre-burst mode for stills has also been added, which is cool. I just wish we had the option to use it in video as well. Overall though, it's a really solid update that you can download now on Panasonic's website. Old Fast Glass has taken the Fujifilm GFX 100 Mark II and modified it into a more traditionally designed cinema camera. This camera has clearly been designed to take the excellent sensor from the GFX 100 Mark II, but format it in a way that makes it far easier for people to use on more professional sets where a mirrorless camera design just won't cut it. Old Fast Glass have designed a ton of mechanical rigging here, as well as developed the electronics for the camera's remote run stop, STI and power distro on the front and back of the camera. However, they have used other existing bits and bobs around this package to complete it, including C7 adapters PL and LPL mounts, an Atomos Shogun Ultra on the AC side, and Ari's Bud 1 system on the bottom. They've even repositioned the GFX100 Mark II's LCD into a better position for the operator side of the camera, though this is a permanent mod to the camera. It definitely turns the GFX100 Mark II into a large camera, but it's clearly been designed for productions that want and can handle that with their workflows. It's rental only currently, but Old Fast Glass are looking at selling it in the future. 
a bunch of new lenses have been announced at NEB, so let's take a quick look through them. Starting with Atlas, and they have announced three new focal lengths for their Orion 2x anamorphic series of lenses, including an 18mm T2, 135mm T2.2, and 200mm T2.2. The 18mm is actually the world's widest production 2x anamorphic lens. The field of view this thing captures looks insane. It's going to be really interesting to see how people utilize such a wide anamorphic. A 200mm 2x anamorphic is also a really interesting addition, as it's quite rare to see longer focal length anamorphic primes. I'm intrigued to get these in for testing when we can. Blazar have updated their Remus line of 1.5x anamorphics with a 35mm T1.6 for Super 35 and a 33mm T1.6 for full frame cameras. We've got the Remus in currently for testing, and they are pretty good considering their price, incredibly compact size, and image circle. These new focal lengths bring the setup to five lenses, or four basically if you grab one of these new 30mm-ish focal lengths. They also announced the Kato 2x anamorphic series consisting of the 40, 50, 85, and 125mm, all of which cover full frame sensors. They do have inconsistent T stops, with the 50mm being the fastest at T2 and the 125mm being the slowest at T3.2. Considering that they are 2x anamorphic full frame lenses, they look surprisingly small and light. They will be available with either PL or EF mounts, and from what Blazar was saying on their booth, should be decently affordable just like the Remus are. Nissi have introduced three new focal lengths for their Athena Cine Prime series, an 18mm T2.2, 14mm T1.9, and 135mm T2.2. This brings the Athena set up to eight lenses, which is really comprehensive now. We really liked the initial five lenses when we tested and reviewed them last year, we were incredibly impressed with their clean, great looking imagery, fantastic size and solid feeling mechanics. And we actually have the 40mm and 135mm in currently for testing. So if you have any questions about them, let us know below and expect a video on them soon. They also had a 2x PL to PL teleconverter, which I can't find anything about online. These though have released a few new focal lengths to their Pavo series of 2x anamorphic primes. This includes a 65mm T2.8 macro, 135mm T2.4 and 180mm T2.8, bringing the set to 9 focal lengths. Having a macro is interesting, as it's quite rare to see with anamorphics. The 65mm can focus all the way down to 36cm, which is a 1 to 2 magnification ratio. The tele editions are also good, as it fleshes out the top end of the set now. They will be available in the same range of flare variants, and feature similar build, sizing and design to the previous Pavo lenses. They also announced the Arla series of T1.5 Cine Primes. These are a bit larger than their previous Vespid series, but that's not too surprising given the difference in maximum T-stop. There will be a 25, 35, 50, 75 and 100mm at release. We have a few focal lengths into tests currently, so let us know if you have any questions about them. There isn't pricing yet on these, but I am intrigued to see where they sit considering their size and speed. Dulens have announced their Triassic Prime series of cinema lenses. This set of APO primes draws heavily on the design of the APO Mini, but with improved close focus performance. The set will consist of a 25, 35, 50, 90 and 120mm, with close focuses you can see here. They definitely look a little bit larger than the Mini primes, but that's not too surprising given the increased focus range. They are all T2.8, have 80mm front diameters, a floating element design and a 46.5mm image circle. They sound and look pretty nice. I love their Mini Prime, so I'm excited to see them. They also had the 21mm Mini Prime on show, which I'm excited to get my hands on too. Announced a 110mm for the Mini Prime series earlier this month, and have a new case for their Mini Prime set. Lau have announced their Ranger Super 35 series of zoom lenses. The range consists of an 11 to 18, 17 to 50, and 50 to 130mm, all of which have a maximum aperture of T2.9 a rated image circle of 31.5mm, and 11 aperture blades. They look incredibly small, especially when mounted onto larger cinema cameras. I think this will make them really popular with smaller Super 35 or APS-C cameras, like the Red Komodo, Sony FX30, or Fujifilm X-H2S. I'm really intrigued to see how they are priced, and what kind of image they can capture. Viltrox was showing off two new focal lengths of their epic 1.33x full-frame anamorphics a 25mm and a 100mm, both of which are T2. 
We had the 35, 50 and 75 mm of these lenses in recently for testing and they are surprisingly clean and sharp. If you want us to take a look at these in a future video, let us know in the comments. Tokina have announced four new focal lengths to their Vista P range of lenses. A 40, 65, 105 and 135 mm, all of which are T1.5, bringing the Vista P set to nine focal lengths currently. The Vista P series are tuned versions of Tokina's Vista Primes, which are known for being very nice, clean lenses. So these Vista P's are aimed at being slightly more arty and interesting than those. This is achieved by coating changes and element spacing to try and add some more character to the lenses. They do look nice, and these new focal lengths will make them even more interesting for some people. Modulate have announced both L-mount and X-mount for their existing tuners. This is a good addition and opens up the use of their tuners to Fuji users, Panasonic S-series and Leica users who want to experiment with these vintage tuned adapters. We should be doing a video on them very soon, so let us know if you have any questions down below. Sony launched their latest E-mount lens, the 16-25mm f2.8G. This is a full frame lens designed to be a more compact and affordable option when compared to Sony's 16-35mm f2.8G master lenses. It's a really small and compact lens without really compromising too much on image quality. We had it in recently and it does perform very well. I think it could be a good pairing with the FX3 or 30 for compact handheld shooting or on a gimbal or even on the Ronin 4D using the optional E-mount. Here's a quick overview of the specs and price. It's available to pre-order now on our website, link to which is down below. Fujinon have announced some more details about their upcoming 14 to 100 mm T2.9 to 3.9 Duvo lens. Here's a quick chart of the new specs that were announced. It looks like a really great zoom range for Super 35 cameras, and you can even enable a 1.6x extender, which will enable it to work with a full frame camera, or increase the focal length by 1.6x on Super 35 cameras. Canon has released a new broadcast lens, the CJ27. It's a B4 mount 27x zoom for 2 3rd inch broadcast cameras. It starts at 7.3mm and goes all the way through to 197mm, and considering the size of it, that's pretty impressive. It also has a bunch of ergonomic changes and features a new focused breathing compensation mode in certain parts of the zoom range. Sure have announced both a 16mm and 75mm T1.2 in their Nightwalker series of Cine lenses. These are super compact, fast, super 35 lenses that are decently affordable, and these new focal lengths now round the set out to five lenses. Considering their price, they look like pretty good lenses. Atmos released a couple of new interesting products at NAB this year, starting with the Ninja Phone. This is essentially a Ninja that uses an iPhone 15 Pro or Pro Max as the primary interface and recording device. It uses a case designed by Atmos for these phones, which can then be mounted onto the Ninja phone itself, which can then provide a HDMI input that can take a signal from a camera, encode it, and send it to your phone for monitoring using Atmos's excellent UI and tools, recording, and streaming. It can capture a mix of ProRes, H.265 and H.264, but it is limited to 1080p, which will be fine for streaming, but I think that even most social content creators will want to capture 4K now, so it's definitely aimed more at being a monitor, proxy recorder, or streaming device that you add onto your camera. It can be powered via battery, USB-C, or external source via the battery adapter, and it will power your phone while it's connected. It's priced at $399 and is available to pre-order now. Atmos have decided to pivot into lights with their new Sundragon 16 foot or 5 meter LED strip light with a CRI of 99 and a TLCI of 98. This is like a pretty hefty strip light, is decently waterproof and has a peak brightness of 2000 lumens across the strip, which is incredibly bright for this type of fixture. It has a power draw of roughly 80 watts and comes with a controller for it as well. It looks like it could be quite a flexible fixture to use which is good considering its $990 price tag. Just prior to NAB, Atomos announced AtomOS update 11.05.00 for a range of their monitor recorders. It adds new NDI functionality and a bunch of little changes, which we've put on screen now. Pause to give it a read. Aperture have announced their new InfiniMat system. This is a new range of LED light mats that will be available in a range of sizes from 1x2 all the way up to 20x20 currently. They can be used flat or inflated, and they can be mounted and controlled together for larger configurations. It looks like a really nice system, and with how fantastic Aperture's existing fixtures and control is, I think these will be popular. 
Talking about control, Aperture also announced Sidus One and Sidus Link Pro. Sidus Link Pro is their new control app and Sidus One is a wireless DMX transceiver, which will connect to any lighting app, including Sidus Link Pro. Sidus Link Pro has been designed for more complex professional sets and can control lights a few different ways. There's only really teasers live of this currently, so I'm excited to see this all properly in action. Teradek has announced the A750 wireless video set, Bolt 6 internal antenna versions, and the Prism Flex 2 system. The Bolt 6 internal antenna system has the same functionality as the regular Bolt 6 systems, but obviously has this new internal antenna system. It's a shame that this isn't a user interchangeable upgrade. The A750 is Teradek's new affordable entry into their zero delay wireless video systems. It's HDMI only, has a range of up to 750 feet, and has an internal antenna design. It can be powered via an onboard battery, via an optional plate, or via the DC input. It's priced at just over £1,000 for a TXRX set, which for a zero delay Teradex system isn't too bad. And lastly, they announced their new Prism Mobile 5G and Prism Mobile Mark II systems designed for more live production on location work. Core SWX have announced the Hypercore G3 batteries and the Powerbase Edge Snap system. The G3 features a new physical design, a side-mounted LCD for runtime display or percentage readout, and wraparound LEDs, which you can change the color of for differentiation on set. This is a 14 volt battery, but does have a maximum 20 amp draw, which is really good. It also has a good range of power outputs, which includes Core SWX's new PD Pro standard. This new port uses USB-C to provide PD power in a more professional way. You can pull between five to 48 volts. The port's reversible. It can be used with existing USB-C cables and it enables you to charge the batteries via these ports very quickly. Each output is independent and it also removes the worry of blowing your SDIs as the connection is simultaneous between positive and negative. The PD Pro connection is locking with the correct cables and it can actually tell the battery what voltage to output as well depending on what cable you use. It looks like a really well thought out system and it's also featured in their other new battery system, the Powerbase Edge Snap. This new battery is expanding on their previous generation Powerbase battery, but with a few cool additions. These are 49 watt hour 14 volt batteries that feature a good range of inputs and outputs, and they have the ability to snap together. This isn't just for mounting, but also for stacking batteries, as they connect together electronically when doing this as well. They use really strong magnets to clip together, and they do feel very solidly connected, but are decently easy to get off. When connected together, they also charge in parallel, and can be charged via the USB-Cs on them. They've also designed a nice looking mounting plate for these, which features a nice hidden V-mount, which will make mounting them really easy and flexible. They are available to pre-order now on our website. Tilda have introduced their new series of video focused tripod systems, the CT8, CT12, and CT25, all of which feature fluid heads. The CT8 is the smallest and lowest payload out of the three. It can handle payload ranges of four to eight kilograms, and comes with these telescopic 75mm bowl three-stage carbon fiber legs. The CT12 can handle payloads up to 12 kilograms and comes with a different set of legs. These use a single lever to adjust the full height of the legs, which is nice. You can also use a 75 or 100mm bowl head with them via an adapter. Both the CT8 and CT12 use a Manfrotto style plate, which is a good standard to use. All of the heads feature drag and counterbalance adjustments, with the larger heads having more steps and range. The CT25 will be a larger model coming in the future for even bigger camera packages, but the CT8 and the CT12 are available to pre-order now, and they seem pretty well priced. Tilter also had the Mirage Matbox Pro on their stand as well, which looks like a larger version of the Mirage Matbox, which came out a couple of years back now. Smorg have announced a few new products at NAB, and this includes a couple of cool looking influencer collaborations. First off is their really nice looking Tribex hydraulic carbon fiber tripod that is designed with potato jet. The thing that makes this look interesting is how you use one adjustment lever to unlock and position all three tripod legs simultaneously. There's no pricing yet, but it looks like quite a cool system. Up next is their new VB212 V-mount battery, co-designed with Kayla Pike from DSLR Video Shooter. It's a 212 watt hour battery that has a bunch of improvements over their previous remount batteries. It has two USB-C PD ports that can deliver up to 140 watts of power each, while also giving you dual DTAP ports, a BP port, and an extra USB-A port. 
It can charge from 0 to 100% in only 2 hours over USB-C and can handle 19 amps of current draw which is very impressive. It also looks pretty well priced considering its feature set and size. Up next is their collaboration with Andy Axe, which is the Creator Toolkit. This is the little pelly that comes with a bunch of tools and other bits that you may need while out on location shooting. It looks like quite a nice little tidy solution that you could just chuck in your car as a backup in case you forget your main tool bag or some tape in your regular kit bag. They also teased their new series of Hawklock quick release products and announced the mobile video kit co-designed with Brandon Lee. They also had a prototype E to PL mount variable ND mount, which could be interesting if it performs well. Mid49 have created and released a range of new LCD extension cables for Sony cameras that use the 40 pin monitor cable such as the FX6, FX9, and Burano, and even a few older Sony cameras. They are available in a few different lengths from 30cm all the way up to 762cm, and the shorter lengths look pretty tidy and are decently affordable as well. They also announced their new power distribution box, the DB8, for the Sony Burano. This will be available in both V or Gold mount and provides a range of inputs and outputs and can enable power hot swap with the 4-pin XLR input. DAT had a range of new products on display, including their newest shotgun microphones, the S-Mic 3s. These are much lighter than the previous generation and they have proved the ecosystem of accessories around them as well. The smallest S-Mic 3 is actually the lightest shotgun microphone in the world, so it will be great for smaller handheld camera configurations. They also had their new 3-pin XLR plug-on called the DXTX, which is part of their Theos wireless system, so it has the ability to integrate into that system and record 32-bit flow audio on the transmitter itself. They also had the PR2 on display and it turns out it's actually shipping next month, which is awesome to hear. Cordbag, which we actually use a lot when packing and organising our kit, had a few new goodies on show. This included a smaller pouch for smaller bits like media and screws. They also had the grid lid system which attaches into the lid of a Peli. This looks like a 1510 Peli size Nanak case in this video and it allows you to attach the pouches to the top of your Peli which looks pretty neat. They also showed off their new quick release magnetic mounting system called Maglock. They also had an LED strip for Peli cases which would be good for darker environments. And they also teased some new products which are NFC tags which you can attach onto various pouches and Pelis and then catalog them using your app. Right, let's get into our quick fire honorable mentions. Links to details about these are in the description below. Axiom released the Cineview 2 SDI wireless video system, Como intercom system, and added support for Frame IO to the CMU 4K. Azure released software version 2.1 for their color box. Asus were showing off their new ProArt display 32 inch 8K HDR mini LED monitor. Bebop announced the V240 micro V-mount battery and the Cube 1200 and 700 block batteries. Bitpart have announced their Bitbox remote camera control unit. Birddog released the X1 and X1 Ultra PTZ cameras, their new Mackie Ultra box camera and updated Birddog Cloud 10.1. Chimera announced their Tube Pro light banks product line. EasyRig was showing off their Boom Rig, which is basically an EasyRig for boom operators. Frame.io announced their V4 beta, Hollyland teased their Pyro wireless video system, iFootage announced the Cobra 3 Strike monopod, Innovative announced their motorized Apollo car, Insta360 announced their X4 8K 360 camera, KinoFlow showed off their Celeb Icon 6 LED panel fixture, Electrosonics announced their new sub-miniature DSSM transmitter, Lexar announced their new rugged series of SD cards and their new Pro Workflow Thunderbolt 4 dock, Light Panels released their Astra IP series of LED panels and accessories. Miller Tripods announced the SkyFX 9 fluid head. Nanlite announced the Pavo Slim 240, 240C and 60CL and teased the Alien 150C and 300D panel fixtures. Next Storage have announced their new series of B2 Pro CF Express Type B cards, which are incredibly fast. Obsbot announced the Tiny 2 Lite PTZ webcam and their new talent software. ProGrade announced CF Express 4 Type B and Type A Iridium cards. Proton Cam was showing off their new series of tiny cameras. Rigwheels has announced the T0 Vibration Isolator for PTZ cameras. Rode released three new products, their Interview Pro Broadcast Mic, a new phone cage and phone magnetic mount kit. Sackler introduced their Ace M Mark II and Ace XL Mark II of fluid heads along with updated tripod systems. Sennheiser showcased the MKH 830 mic. Shape introduced the Basecamp 15,000 power station. Shure released their MV7 Plus podcast microphone. 
SwitchD has announced their upcoming PageOS 6 update for their series of monitors and released the Quantum 32, their new 31.5 inch OLED monitor, which does look quite nice. Sony have launched their latest PTZ camera, the BRC AM7, and released the firmware update for the A6700. Switch introduced the Omni V-mount battery series. Tilter finally released the Kronos ecosystem for iPhone. Zcam had their new E2Z Plus PTZ camera on show. And lastly, Xi'an announced the Molus B100, 200, 300, 500, and G300 LED cob light fixtures. Right, well, I think that was everything. Thanks for watching, and if I've missed anything out, let us know in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next one.